He said, I welcome you tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that the word will do good in every life. Make us uh, better ministers and workers and liberals in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. You are blessed. I am blessed. The Lord make it permanent in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the workers' meeting tonight. Thank you for the faithfulness of your children, your servants, sons and daughters, our teachers and leaders too. We're asking, Lord, that we will not come in vain. And that everything we hear will do good in every life in Jesus' name. As we've been doing before, bless your people tonight once again. And use us as channels of blessings for the whole church. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a good, good day. Amen. We're coming to Jude chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. As we look at those words, the faith, that actually means the sum total of all the teaching that Christ himself, that he taught, and he committed to the saints in the scriptures, to the apostles, and is very, very important. There are many things that we find important in our lives, very essential for every brother, every sister, every member of the church, and every minister. And as you think about the important things in your life, for example, your own salvation, the peace we have with God, happiness and joy in Christ, and the promise and also the possession of healing and health. You think about fellowship and unity among the brethren. Those things are very important. You think of our success, you think of our progress, you think of our wealth and well-being, you think of our position and our influence because we are lights in the world, shining and reflecting the light of Christ. Yet, greater than all those important things is the faith, the faith, the word, the gospel, the truth that says is greater than all possessions, any possession we have. If we are diligently protecting and preserving all these other good possessions, then it becomes very necessary that we'll protect the faith above every other thing that we have. Since it's more important than any other thing we have, if we protect those things, then we should help Chile and earnestly protect, preserve, contain for the faith which is greater than all things. As we come to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your fears that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. It says, There'll be unity among the people of God, among the ministers and the members, that with one mind and with one heart and with one spirit, we're earnestly striving together for the faith. Like Paul the Apostle has done, 
with you what we'll do in Jesus' name. In Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 7, Colossians chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. It's not just that we have heard the faith, believed the faith, and we're living by the grace of God in the faith. We're rooted in it. And we're built up in it. And we're established in it. As she have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And then he tells us in verse 8, as you understand the faith, apply the faith, believe the faith, you are rooted in that faith, and built up in that faith, that will beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy of vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiment of the world, and not after Christ. There are many things that might try to infiltrate, but we reject them, we throw them away, we take heed that this faith we're rooted in will remain in it. Look at verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. We don't need any other tradition to add, any other opinion to add, any other philosophy to add, any other religious ideas coming from anywhere from the north or the south or the west or the east. We don't need any addition. It says, ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. We are complete. And the Lord will make us satisfied in the sufficiency of the faith in Jesus' name. Now in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7, that's why Paul the Apostle says, I have fought a good fight. I have fought a good fight. He wasn't fighting for ceremonies. That's a bad fight. He wasn't fighting for circumcision. That would be a bad fight. He wasn't fighting for the old covenant that is abolished, already passed away. That's a bad fight. He wasn't fighting for the denomination he led and the Sanhedrin that he had led, that yes, we believe Christ, we believe salvation, we believe Calvary, but how about what Gamaliel told me? He wasn't fighting for Gamaliel. And so he fought a good fight, and he said, I finished my course. And you can tell what he said he fought for, I have kept the faith. The Lord will give us grace, will keep the faith in Jesus' name. Tonight, we're looking at the message, Protecting the Faith Above All Else in Ministry. Protecting the Faith Above All Else in Ministry. There are many things that come to us as part of the ministry. Administration is part of the ministry. Supervision is part of the ministry. And helping people part of the ministry, visiting people, part of the ministry. You think about all the activities we have, all the challenges we have, and all the duties we have uh, to concentrate on and make sure that we do them effectively. And yet, as you think about everything, no matter what the number, no matter how important those things are, the most important is the faith. Is the word because it's the word that saves, it's the word that sanctifies, it's the word that shows us the way into the baptism in the Holy Ghost. It is the word that makes us stand in holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Any other thing apart from the word will not save, and so we cannot give equal attention to the faith and to all these other wonderful and good things. That's what we're talking about, protecting the faith above all else in ministry. As we look at Jude chapter 1, verses 3 to 7, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, preserving the incorruptibility of the faith's perfection. 
the faith's perfection. The faith is complete. The faith needs no addition. The faith needs no subtraction. The faith needs no modification. It is perfect as the Lord has given it to us. And so we want to preserve the incorruptibility of the perfection of that faith. Point number two, purging the inconsistency of feeble preachers. There are people that become feeble and faint. They have been fighting for the truth and contending for the faith and doing the right thing, but there will be challenges, there will be crossroads. There might be difficulties in our personal lives, challenges in our families, challenges in the ministry, challenges in the local church. Because of those challenges, some people become inconsistent. They become unstable. And we need to purge ourselves from the inconsistency of feebleness that come upon preachers sometimes. You understand? Even Elijah became tired and weary. Even Moses said, Have I begotten these people? It's too hard for me. It's too much for me. Paul the apostle said, Fears within and fight without. The challenges were there. But in spite of all those challenges, we're going to remain strong. You will remain strong in Jesus' name. Purging the inconsistency of feeble preachers. Point number three, preventing the infiltration of false prophets. Infiltration. The devil uses uh, two things majorly. Number one, persecution. And if the devil sees the persecution and pressure, fiery persecution will not stop the church then he will try the other tool, which is infiltration, and send people who are not sound in the faith, and send them, they become pastors of some of the churches, and they become leaders, and they become workers, and they become spokesmen, and they become important personalities and influences and influencers in the church, and they are not sound, and they are false prophets. But they have infiltrated. That's why it says in verse 4 of Jude, Jude chapter 1, verse 4. He uses a word there in verse 4. He says, For there are certain men crept in unawares. That means to sneak in, to creep in unnoticed. But by the grace of God, will prevent every infiltration of false prophets in Jesus' name. Somebody said, Amen. Amen. Point number one, preserving the incorruptibility of the faith's perfection. Always remember, every doctrine of the Word of God is pure and perfect. And whenever you have any tendency or temptation to suffer and to change anything, remember, you cannot improve on the Bible. The Bible is all right the way it is. And the Bible is inspired from cover to cover. It's been given to us. You will not pollute it or corrupt it in Jesus' name. Look at verse 3. It says, Beloved, you are beloved in heaven. You are beloved in the sight of God. And you must keep that title that the Lord has given you. When I give all diligence, it says, I wanted to write. And I give all diligence. Anything you want to do in the kingdom of God, you give all diligence. You want to teach, you give all diligence. You want to preach, you give all diligence. You want to go out and evangelize, you give all diligence. You're doing a women's ministry, um, you know, anytime. You give all diligence. You don't just come from the office and come from the market and then take your Bible, we're going. That's not diligence. It says, I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Even though it's the common salvation, is the salvation available for the Jews and for the Gentiles, the salvation that you have tasted yourself, even though you have experienced it, 
he has experienced it and she has experienced it come unto us all as he gave all diligence to write unto you of that common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you the holy spirit now said we're bad enough of that of that salvation they know it they understand it have something broader have something wider have something greater talk about the faith which includes salvation includes christian living includes all the doctrines of the bible includes everything jesus not teaching them all things whatsoever i have commanded you that's the faith everything it says write about that faith and tell them that there is a battle raging and there is a battle everybody in the church every member every minister must get involved with and they're not just doing it and saying okay the pastor can do that we'll support him we'll say yes to everything he says but we'll just be on the sideline watching he says no that we must earnestly one and all contain for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints that word is perfect the word of god is perfect i said the word of god is perfect look at psalm 19 we're reading from verse 7 psalm 19 reading from verse 7 it says the law of the lord is perfect when something is perfect if you try to adjust it it becomes imperfect when something is complete if you add to if you try to add to it then it becomes imperfect when something is sufficient if you subtract from it it becomes insufficient imperfect it says the law of the lord is perfect converting the soul think about that the word of god is perfect and when you give it exactly as it is given repentance and faith in the lord jesus christ compassion will come and then he says the testimony of the lord is sure making wise the simple if you dilute it with water if you dilute it with any other substance it's no more as it ought to be it is no more sure it is no more certain you are taking something away from that foundation and that foundation will not be strong enough to bear the weight of the people standing on that foundation the statutes of the lord are right rejoice in the heart the commandment of the lord is pure enlightening the eyes the fear of the lord is clean enduring forever and the judgments of the lord are true and righteous all together more to be desired are they than gold yea than much fine gold it says this word of god is much more to be desired than gold than money than material things why gold will not take us to heaven money will not take us to heaven riches wealth will not take us to heaven but the truth of the word of god will take us to heaven that's why the truth the faith is more important than gold and silver sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb moreover by them thy servant is warned and in keeping of them the there is great reward look at some 119 119 we're reading from verse 27 and verse 128 127 128 some 119 it says in 127 therefore i love thy commandments above gold yea above fine gold we must keep that attitude of mind we must keep that posture that we love the bible we love the faith we love the totality of the word of god above gold above much fine gold 
therefore, verse 128, therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right and I hate every false way. Put that in our normal language in the Christian life and Christian ministry in the New Testament. It says, therefore, I esteem all precepts, small and great, big and small, all precepts. I don't ever say that's small. We don't have to think about Bible on that. That's little. We don't have to think about the word of God on that. I esteem, I exalt all thy precepts concerning all things, concerning all things. And whatever the word of God will not approve of, will not accept, we're not going to accept. I hate every false way. I hate every false doctrine. Every false doctrine. It may come in from a respected personality. Before you knew that that man teaches that you had heard about him. Before you knew that that woman upholds something like that, you had heard about her. And you respected her. You respected him. And then one day, maybe you read something he has written. Or maybe you hear something he has recorded. You say, what? So that's what he believes. At the moment you discover that, you'll not say, well, okay, everybody has his but Therefore, I still respect him. No, I hate every false way. Anybody who contradicts the word of God does not merit your sympathy, does not merit your respect or honor. Look at Psalm 12, verse 6. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. Perfect. The words of the Lord are pure words. And then he says, A silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. He says, A silver that is tried in the furnace of the earth. What happens is, they take the silver. And they put it in the furnace. Then it is melted. They take the impurities away. Then they put it in the fire again the second time. And if the sin is or, or any impurity, they take that away. They do that seven times. Seven is the number for perfection, completeness. And now they see that there's no impurity at all. That's what it means. It says the words of the Lord are pure words. A silver that is tried in the furnace of the earth purified seven times. The word of God is pure, no addition, no subtraction. Are you here, my people? Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. We're reading from verse 5. Proverbs 30, reading from verse 5. Every word of God is pure. See that. Every word of God is pure. There are some people, when they are preaching, they read a particular verse. Then they say, I think it will be more correct to say it this other way. They're trying to correct the Bible. Have you noticed that Jesus Christ, whenever he quoted the Bible, he quoted it straight. Whenever he quoted the Old Testament, he didn't say, I am the Son of God, I want to adjust it now, and then adjust it. No, he gave the meaning, the deep spiritual meaning. Of course, he corrected the tradition of the Pharisees when he said, you have heard that they say you love your neighbor, but you hate your enemy. That's what the Pharisees added. So he corrected what the Pharisees added and he said, love your neighbor, love everyone. And then somebody said, who is my neighbor? And he gave the parable of the good Samaritan. Everyone is your neighbor. The word of God says, love them. And so we find here in verse 5, every word of God is pure. 
he is a shield to them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words. You don't have to. You don't need to. You are not competent to. You are not as wise as God. And you are not wiser than God. You are not higher than God. You don't have more knowledge than God. You cannot add to what he has said. You cannot take away from what he has said. He is perfect. He is our creator. He, his knowledge is more than the knowledge of all the millions and the billions of the people in the world put together. He is God. He is infinite. He is eternal. And so, all the people of the world, all the seminaries of the world, theological institutions in the world, colleges in the world, put all of them together. Their knowledge, their wisdom is not as high, as great as that of the Almighty God. That's why nobody is qualified to add to the Word of God or subtract from the Word of God. It says in verse 6, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Look at Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. We're reading from verse 18 and verse 19. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Anyone that comes on and he says he wants to improve on what God has revealed. He wants to improve on what Jesus Christ has taught. He wants to improve on the predictions and the prophecies of the Word of God. He says, looking at what is happening now, and looking at, uh, you know, the things that uh, we have read about in the Bible, I, I think with the current affairs and the knowledge we now have, we need to adjust all those things Jesus said in this place and this place and that place. It says anyone that comes up and he claims to be wiser and higher than Jesus or than God, God will add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Verse 19, and if any man shall take away, take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, it says, uh, you know, that one doesn't fit uh, the uh, modern time. Talking about uh, blood, the blood that washes us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. There is power in the blood. You know, when you talk about blood, that one doesn't go down well with modern people. Therefore, let's remove the, about the blood of Jesus and then about the crucifixion of Christ. How is it that those uh, people did that and it is that cruelty against Jesus that is going to save us? Let us remove that. Or somebody says about uh, holiness, let's remove that. Somebody talks about this, about that one man, one wife. He doesn't, he, he doesn't fit the time. Look at, if you know the register, and you know the people who have already divorced, and you are saying that except this happens, somebody cannot get to heaven. Yes, we know Jesus said that for that time, for that century. But for this time we're living in now, they're taking away from the word of God. It says, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of, the, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. Once again, you are religious. Once again, you are important. You are highly favored. And people, you are gathering crowds. And people listen to you. And they say, that's my preacher. That's my man. He, he tries to bench to the people. He understands the weakness of people. And so he tailors his doctrine, his teaching to feed the weakness of the people. You are popular with the people, but then your name is out of the book of life. Your name will not go out of the book of life. 
and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book that's why it says we need to earnestly contend contend the word of god is perfect and we want to keep the incorruptibility of that word the lord will help you and the lord will help me will keep on earnestly contending for the faith every time everywhere whoever is there whoever is not there will keep on contending for the faith in jesus name how do we contend like jesus contended with the pharisees the traditionalists exposing them and warning against their false doctrine so must we do jesus christ did not allow false doctrine to just go like that tradition to just go like that error to just go like that the same way that jesus contended that's the same way we ought to contain how do we contend like jesus contended with peter the foremost disciple the number one apostle like he contended with him firmly uncompromisingly publicly and pointedly so must we do we mustn't have any friend we mustn't have anyone that we love so much that teaches false doctrine and then we'll say i love him so much and i cannot say anything about this now i don't want anything to spoil or disturb our relationship you can do that like jesus contended with that first uh, most foremost apostle and he did it firmly and uncompromisingly he did it publicly and pointedly and said get thee behind me satan because you do not understand the things that belong to god but the things that belong to men that's how to contain we're going to contain like paul contended with the judaizers the Judaizers are the people that they said it's okay to believe on Jesus Christ. It's okay to be born again, but they must be circumcised. He contended with them, and we must contend like Paul contended with Judaizers, resisting the error of respected preachers, and so must we do. How do we contend? We must contend like Moses. Like Moses contended with Aaron, the high priest. Do you remember that Aaron was his senior brother, the same father, the same mother? And yet, as Aaron led the people astray, he contended with him. So must we do. Like Moses contended against Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who were famous in the assembly so must we do it must be very clear that we regard the faith the word of god higher than self so you are not saying if i do that and i contain for the faith if the people don't like me for that i don't have any other friends all my friends are in the church and if i contain and then i lose all those friends i'll be lonely you don't think about that it must be so clear that you love the faith you abide in the faith you esteem the faith higher than self number two higher than any man and every man it must be very clear you appreciate people you love people like paul the apostle respected peter and he said, it's one of the three pillars in the church. Then he said, but when he came to Antioch, he was to be blamed because he was with the other believers. When the other people came, he went away from the Gentiles and I confronted him. Paul the apostle lifted the faith higher than any man. We must lift up the faith beyond the family. It may be that some members of your family are not believing exactly everything you believe. Maybe a wife, maybe a husband, maybe a child, maybe anybody in the family. 
you cannot tailor and twist and distort the word of God just because one of the members of your family is not towing the line and standing by your word. You must show it very clearly that you exalt the faith higher than the family. You must show that you exalt the faith above anyone that is called bishop, bishop, apostle, senior apostle, whatever the name. You must exalt the faith above the title of anyone. Maybe you have heard or want to. Uh, the other churches are asking that we bring the Bible study to them. So far, so good. But... We're not doing that at the expense of compromising the faith. If there is any bishop, any apostle that will say, well, we don't totally believe the Bible. This is what we believe. We're not going to twist the word of God because of any apostle or because of any bishop. We must exalt the faith, the word of God above every bishop. Give me a good amen. We must exalt the faith above money. You see, there are sometimes the people cut corners and they, they know in their conscience doing this is bribery, this is corruption. And but they want the money, they want the business. When you understand what the Lord is saying, that you exalt the faith above every other thing, you'll exalt the faith above money. If you lose money and you keep the faith, that's great. If you lose the faith and gain money, that's disastrous. We exalt the faith above money. We exalt the faith above denomination. Denomination. There's a denomination and they want us to be friendly. They want us to, you know, work with them. They want us to do this and that. Only that they're saying, this is our tradition. Don't ever touch that. This is our very firm commitment. Don't ever touch that. This is a revelation our founders saw. We know it's not in the Bible. And we know we cannot even defend it with chapter and verse in the Bible. But our founder in our denomination, this is what is said. Therefore, we're friendly. You can come and help us. You can do this. But don't touch that area. We exalt the faith above denomination. We exalt the faith above the world, above the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so, if we're going to get to heaven, thank God I'm going to heaven. I said, thank God I'm going to heaven. I lost some of the people, they, don't, they are not sure anymore. I said, thank God I'm going to heaven. You will get there in Jesus' name. That's why it's telling us in First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4. We're reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, very plainly, pointedly, clearly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Some shall depart from the faith thank god not everybody will depart and i happen to be one of the people that will abide in the faith i will abide in the faith some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils devils have doctrines any doctrine that is not in line with the revelation of christ is of the devil Anything that supports cell, supports the flesh, is of the devil. Anything that gives honor to Satan, honor to the evil spirits, honor to superstition, and will not stay and stand by the word of God, is of the devil. Some of the people who have departed, they give it to seducing spirits, they have been enticed speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron verse 6 if thou put the brethren 
in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Verse 15, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You will get to heaven. Your converts will get to heaven. Members of our church will get to heaven in Jesus' name. Point number two now. Purging the inconsistency of feeble preachers. Come back to Jude, verse 3, beloved. When I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you. Needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you. I want you to take that word you as if it's personalized unto you. Because, you know, everybody's business is no man's business. If you throw it over your shoulder to another person, another person, and they also throw it over their shoulders to another person, nobody is going to do it. But you in particular, that he's exhorting you, that you will earnestly contain for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints how is that possible we must have backbone we must have courage we must have stability if we're going to do that to earnestly contend for the faith was delivered unto the saints but if we're weak and feeble we'll be inconsistent and we'll be unable to earnestly Contend for the faith, earnestly protect the faith, earnestly preserve the faith. That means then, if there's anything that causes feebleness in us, in you or in me, I must make it a point of priority. This thing weakens me. I must go back to Calvary and go back to the cross and be purged from whatever weakens me you will know after you become a christian after you became a minister a preacher of the word of god you will know in the history of your christian life in the history of your ministry what weakens you and that thing that weakens you will make you feeble you will not be able to preserve the faith or protect the faith so what are those things that have the tendency of making us feeble, weak, that we are not able to earnestly contend for the faith? Number one, the fear of man. The fear of man. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're reading from verse 24. 1 Samuel 15, verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Calamity comes upon a minister when he has a man-fearing spirit. When whatever he wants to do is looking at this and looking at that and see whether they will say, all right, that's good, go ahead. He cannot stand on his own feet. He cannot stand 
on the revelation of the word that is so very clear to him. He cannot take his stand on what he knows. This is the way what he therein. He has to have the consent and the agreement of people. And if they don't agree, fear of man will not allow him to do what he ought to do. We must be purged from the fear of man. In Proverbs chapter 29, Proverbs chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 25. Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare. You must be purged. Look at Jeremiah chapter 1. In Jeremiah chapter 1, we're reading from verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. He will deliver you. In verse 17, Thou therefore gird up thy lawyers and arise. And speak unto them all that I command thee. Don't surprise. Don't take anything away. Speak the word. Be not dismayed at their faces. Lest I, com com I confound thee before the people. Instead of supporting us, if we have fear of man, the Lord will leave us in the hands of those men will be confounded and ashamed and defeated and trampled on their, under their feet. May that never happen to you in Jesus' name. Number two, what weakens people that they are not able to contend anymore? Number two, fellowship with meddlers. Fellowship with meddlers. They have now become so friendly and they have come in love we have done so meddle and change the word of God and their friendliness has now made them not to care anymore. The first time they heard that man saying something contrary to the scriptures, it shocked them. But now because of friendship, because of fellowship and because of meddling, it doesn't shock them anymore. In Proverbs chapter 24, Reading from verse 21, Proverbs 24, reading from verse 21, My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not with them, don't be so friendly, and don't be so conversant, familiar, in fellowship with the people that change the word of God. They leave the word of God one side and then they are following tradition. Second Chronicles chapter 19. Second Chronicles chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 2. Second Chronicles chapter 19. Reading from verse 2. And Jehu the son of Ananai. The seer went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly? Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Shouldest thou help? A false preacher and then promote his, a false preacher and help him to gather more people to deceive. Should, shouldest thou help the false people? That's why people compromise their fellowship with meddlers. Look at Psalm 139. 
Psalm 139. I'm reading from verse 21. Do I not hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, anyone who hates you, and hates your only begotten Son, and hates Calvary, and hates the cross, and hates salvation, and hates the doctrine that only through the name of Jesus can anyone be saved. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And I'm not, am I not greed with them that rise against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Number one, the fear of man. Number two, fellowship with meddlers. Number three, focus on money. Focus on money. There are people, whatever they preach, if they see that that is going to make them unpopular, and they're going to lose material gain, monetary gain, they say, this doctrine is not going to help me. And the people that bring the you know, large amount of money, I'm going to lose them. And because of that focus on money, that's why they cannot stand on the truth of the word of God earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints titus chapter 1 titus chapter 1 verse 11 whose mouth must be stopped who subvert whole houses teaching us things which they ought not why do they teach what they don't what they are not supposed to teach for filthy lucre's sake, because of money. And because of wanting to have money, wanting to gain the money, whatever it is, superficially, they will teach what they know is wrong. They will not teach the repentance and the faith in Christ and the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord that will make them unpopular. And the people that will contribute money will not contribute enough money because of love for money and focus on money they teach things they ought not to verse 12 one of them even a prophet of their own sage the Christians are always liars evil beasts and slow bellies this witness is true wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith that's a commitment, that's a commission. In fact, we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 5. Perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Why are they destitute of the truth? Supposing that gain is godliness. Supposing that you know, the much money I have from there, then I know the ministry is going on. Then I know the word is going on. Then I'm happy. I know the Lord is blessing me. And then they see that when they teach holiness, people don't, you know, give as they ought to give. When they teach prosperity, joy, laughter, it doesn't matter how many wives you have. When they, when they so pedal and they teach something erroneous, then people clap and people are happy. And because of that, they think and they suppose that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw thyself. A compromiser will not be your friend. A false prophet will not be your friend. A money lover will not be your friend. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. 
for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith covetousness makes them to err from the faith go astray from the faith and they pierce themselves through with many sorrows the things that weaken people and they become feeble false preachers number one the fear of man number two fellowship with meddlers number three focus on money number four fetters in marriage fetters in marriage there are people that they have so much leaning towards their wife leaning towards their partners that those wives and partners dissuade them the woman loves worldliness but she happens to be the wife of a preacher who preaches the word of God without fear and without favor and so when he is uh, going to preach my husband God bless you I hope you are not going to be so strong and firm I had that uh, summary on Tuesday and I had the emphasis of the GS on Tuesday I hope you are not going to go that direction because you know if you go that direction my husband Everybody will be looking my direction. And they will be saying, uh -huh, he knows how to preach. But look at, because of that, the fetters in marriage, the fetters that bind them, the fetters that tie them, they cannot speak the word honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. We're looking at First, first Kings chapter 11. First Kings chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 4. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after their gods, after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father you see that he could no more earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints the things he knew were wrong he couldn't stand against them anymore for some people it's the fetter that binds them from their daughters they love their daughters so much and they love their daughters above the word of God other people is their son that they love so much other people is the extended family and the in-laws and the sin you still stand for that we wouldn't have given you our daughter if we knew you were still going to be standing like that and they change you will not be among them i will not be among them you know especially when you are getting older and then you are no more like a soldier you used to be when you were younger you have no excuse for that but there are some people the older they get the cooler they become it will not happen to you the fire of the spirit will be in your life in your heart every time in jesus name look at verse 5 so solomon went after hashtores the goddess of the Sidonians and after meal come the abomination of the Ammonites and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh the abomination of Moab in the lull in the hill that is before Jerusalem and for Molech the abomination of the children of Ammon likewise did he did he for all his strange wives hundreds of them hundreds of them 
another building they shrine he goes to build another shrine another temple which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods and the lord was angry or solomon of course of course is angry but compromises and backsliders we're looking at uh, first kings chapter 21 first kings chapter 21 i'm reading from verse 25 the fetters in marriage that marriage becomes so important happiness in the marriage becomes so important fellowship in the marriage becomes so important becomes more important than holiness becomes more important than the ministry you have got before the marriage look at first kings chapter 21 verse 25 but there was none like unto ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the lord whom jezebel his wife stirred up jezebel it was the husband but actually was like the wife he couldn't take a decision by himself the wife has to say this how to do it if he was sad he couldn't handle his own sadness and then he'll face the wall and jezebel will say what's the matter you're not eating what's wrong with you i told neighbor to give me his vineyard that i'll pay for it he didn't give me and i don't know what you say you don't know what to do come on rise up and eat i'll give you the vineyard of neighbors and that wicked woman then wrote a letter to the city and he killed Naboth, and then reported, go and possess, I'm giving it to you. There are people like that. They don't have a mind of their own, and they cannot stand, except the wife will say, this is what you do. I pray you'll not be a puppet in your family. And so that your wife, or your daughter, or your son, or anybody, will not tie rope on your leg and be pulling you whatever direction they want you will stand i will stand you'll stand in jesus name number one the fear of man number two fellowship with meddlers number three focus on money number four fetters in marriage number five fondness for miracles fondness for miracles you want miracle 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 all the time and because of that fondness for miracles if wonders are taking place signs and wonders are taking place don't mind the doctrine they don't believe salvation don't mind that they don't believe living above sin don't mind that and they don't mind they don't understand the interpretation of the basic bible verses that tell us how to live and make it ever no don't think about that after all look at the miracles fondness for miracles mark chapter 13. in mark chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 22. mark chapter 13 verse 22 for false christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce if it were possible even the elect signs and wonders miracles some people think that it's only the name of jesus and the pure gospel that works miracle they do not understand that even satan also can produce some so-called miracles revelation chapter 13. in revelation chapter 13 i'm reading here from verse 14. revelation chapter 13 verse 14 and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast 
Say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which at the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Evil spirit and the false prophet walking miracles, they will not deceive you. Chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, verse 13, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet false prophet for they are the spirits of devils doing what i said doing what verse 14 for they are the spirits of devils doing what walking miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of the battle of the great day of God Almighty. They will not deceive you. Chapter 19, verse 20. Chapter 19, verse 20. And the beast and the and him and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles, the false prophets that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Number six, what wickedest people that become feeble, that they cannot articulately, very clearly say, this is the word. Number six, the falsehood of messengers. The falsehood of messengers. Isaiah chapter, chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Want to them that call evil good, and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight ezekiel chapter 13 verse 22 ezekiel 13 verse 22 because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad whom i have not made sad and strengthened the hands of the wicked that ye should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Number seven is the forgetfulness of the word must. The forgetfulness of the word must. There are some verses of scripture that tell you, that tell me, that if you're a leader, this is a must that it's more important than any other thing 
But some people forget that word, must, and they forget the passage of scripture that gives us the word must. And so they compromise. The essential things they cannot uphold. Look at Second Samuel chapter 23. We're reading from verse 3. Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 3. The God of Israel says, The rock of Israel speak unto me. He that rules over men must be just. Underline that word, must. The people who are feeble, they keep on in leadership, keep on in ministry, and they forget that must. We must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Come to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, forgetfulness of the word must. In John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Whatever else we're preaching, if the people are not born again, we're forgotten the word must. Whatever else you emphasize sin, must emphasize that being born again. The forgetfulness of the word must makes people to compromise and they don't emphasize what they ought to emphasize. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Acts 14, 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through tribulation, persecution, enter into the kingdom of God. There are people that avoid persecution. They avoid conflict. They avoid misunderstanding. They avoid pressure. They have forgotten the word must. We must through persecution enter into the kingdom of God. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The day is coming when everyone will appear before the judgment seat. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether they be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. First Peter chapter 4, reading from verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin. Don't forget that. Judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that will be not the gospel of God? I pray will not be forgetful hearers in Jesus' name. I will not be a forgetful hearer. We must remember these are the things that weaken ministers make them feeble that they cannot honestly contain for the faith was delivered unto the saints the fear of man fellowship with meddlers focus on money fetters in the family fondness for miracles falsehood of messengers 
that the forgetfulness of the word must. Now we come back to Jude. I'm reading from chapter 1, verse 4. Preventing the infiltration of false prophets. In your local church, you will not allow infiltration of false prophets. In the group, in the region, in the stage, at the headquarters church, anywhere we have a local church of deeper life, Bible church, we will stand. We will fight the good fight of faith. We will not allow infiltrators to come in and peddle their false doctrines in Jesus' name. Look at verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who are before of old or day to this condemnation. It was known in the word of God before that they will come. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. They talk about grace, but they turn it to license, lasciviousness, and evil. And they turn it to committing sin. Since the grace of God is there, why don't you do as many evils as you can do? Denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Do you once knew this? How that the Lord had saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed them that believed not. They didn't continue believing. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. God will not compromise anyone, angel or man, that go aside and deliver the way of truth. Judgment will come upon them. Verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? Eternal fire. The word of God is very clear that compromisers and false prophets will face condemnation on earth and then in eternity. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. But there are false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately privilege shall bring in damnable heresies, heresies that damn the soul, false doctrines that make people live the way of life eternal and they go into condemnation, heresies that permit sin, that permit backsliding, that permit carelessness, and they dump holiness, and then they follow a careless way of life. Even denying the Lord that bought them, bought them, bought them. They were saved. They were purchased. They were redeemed. But now they deny the Lord who saved them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. I will not follow a false prophet. Whatever the promise, I will not follow a false prophet. You will not perish with false prophets in Jesus' name. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness 
shall deal with faint words, sugar-coated words, fear words, deceitful words, motivating words, a cajoling words, flattering words. They'll make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. You'll not be damned for them. Look at verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved how long i said how long forever you'll not partake in that that heaven will we'll get there together our converse will get there together with us look at matthew chapter 11 matthew chapter 11 verse 20 matthew 11 verse 20 then began he, Christ, to upbraid, to rebuke the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. They repented not. They saw his miracles, they repented not. Tradition captured them. Tradition held them. And the Pharisees will not allow them to be free and to give themselves, even after those many miracles Jesus performed. He upbraided them, look at verse 23, and thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Those angels got to Sodom. They didn't heal any sick one. They didn't restore any withered hand. They didn't open any blind eyes. They didn't do something that the people will marvel and say, we've never seen this. And Lord that went out to tell those people in laws, ah, get out of this place. The Lord will destroy this place. He couldn't pray for them, perform any miracle, and affirm his message with a miracle. But they perished all the same. And Jude tells us there is search in everlasting fire. And now Jesus is saying, all those who have heard his word of repentance and of faith and of upright living and of righteousness greater, higher than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, all those who did not repent, he said in verse 24, but I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Understand? If those Sodomites are going to be in hellfire forever and ever, which is what the word of God confirms, the people that will suffer much more than those Sodomites and the people of Gomorrah their own punishment will be terrible. That's why I'm praying for you. You will not be there. False prophets are serving Satan. They preach some of them half gospel. But please understand, half gospel cannot save. Once you take anything away from the gospel, Let's say you are preaching repentance, but you don't preach faith. Or you are preaching faith, and you are not preaching repentance. Or you are preaching faith and repentance, but you are not preaching that we must continue in the word of God to remain his disciple. If half-half gospel is false gospel, 
Any denial of the truth hinders the soul from complete obedience to God. False prophets who mislead other people and creep into congregations of heaven-bound souls, they sneak in to do evil. They and their followers are walking for the damnation of souls. They will not come into your congregation. They will not spoil the good work God is doing through you. They will not lead any of your converts away in Jesus' name. We must prevent their infiltration. They must not come into our church. If they are here, either they repent and they make restitution, or God will drive them away. We must prevent the infiltration of false prophets. The Lord has spoken to us today, and he wants you to take this word seriously. I know you do. I said, I know you do, that you are earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints in Jesus' name. Will you? I said, will you? Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Earnestly, earnestly, earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Pray that God will strengthen you and all those things that weaken ministers will not weaken you in Jesus' name.